one of the main things that is going to drive you is your mindset. Mm -hmm. You definitely have a routine. Find a way to stay positive because this business isn't easy. You can be at the top one moment and all of a sudden realize that you're going back down and you have to find a way to stay positive and, and keep going because if not, you're, you're just not, you're, you're going to want to quit. So it's not about doing what everybody else is doing. It's, it's about doing what makes you happy. Mm-hmm. You know, we all get into business to be an entrepreneur, to have freedom. And a lot of times we get caught up reading, oh, this person wakes up at four, so I got to do it to be successful. And, and that's not really it. You know, you, you can wake up whenever you want to wake up because that's really what we want to be as entrepreneurs. But when you're up, you better, you better work hard. What's up, guys and gals? Coming at you with another episode of the Carrots Cast. I've got a special guest that I had a chance to meet down in Dallas uh, last year, and I've been following him along the way through the interwebs on Facebook. And I saw a post that he made, and I'll introduce you to Christian here in a second, but I saw a post that he made, I don't know, three, four months ago as the year was turning, and uh, he hit his first million dollar year, but it wasn't just like creaking over a mill. Uh, we'll talk about it here in a bit, but he crushed it uh, last year and dig into his story, dig into what's working. Uh, as a real estate investor and agent, but I want to welcome on uh, Christian onto the onto the Carecast, man. Welcome on. Thank you, man. It's, it's a pleasure to be on here, man. I'm so, I, I'm so stoked. This is <laughs> this is awesome. This was actually one of my goals uh, a long time ago when I first saw the first Carecast. I was like, I'm gonna be on there. Really, dude? That's yeah. cool. <laughs> I love it. I've been. I, I mean, I've been with Investor Fuse. Um, I mean, with uh, Investor Carrot for God since 2000. 15? Yeah. I can tell you exactly when actually, man. Yeah, it's uh it's been yeah, three three years. Uh it, it shows February sixth, two thousand sixteen. So right around there, man. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. It's been a while. I yeah. love it. Well, well, dude, one, one of the things I love, and as you know, on the carrot cast, I love breaking into uh, the entrepreneur story because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter the business model. It doesn't matter if you're an investor or an agent, it doesn't matter if you're you know selling pictures on the wall or or desks or cars. Uh, at the end of the day, entrepreneurs in general have so many things in common. We just happen to be selling different things. Mm-hmm. And so that's my, my favorite thing is digging into the backstory, digging into what decisions did you have to make to get where you are now. And also, I, I always lo- love to dig into the things that aren't, uh, aren't amazing. Like, what are some of the struggles you've had along the way? And have you had to make any pivots and stuff? Because oftentimes those things are the things that relate the most with people listening to this going, oh my gosh, I'm in the same spot as that guy was. And now he's here. I can follow that path. So, dude, let's let, first of all tell people who you who you are. Where where do you do business? What's your company name? And kind of like in general, what's your business model? You know, just so people know what kind of investing you do. I know you have the brokerage too. Yeah. So uh, my name's Christian Marin. I'm I'm in Orlando, Florida. That's our main market. Uh, and my company name is Capital Real Estate Professionals. I've been doing wholesaling since 2014. Our main business model is wholesaling. We also just launched a private lending arm, mm. and it uh, it's actually called Mock Capital. I like it. I like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, we we also just started a property management arm. So our whole goal for our, our company vision is to actually do be a full service investment firm. Mm -hmm. However, we want to tweak it a little different than the turnkey model. Uh, We want to have each thing be individual of itself, right? Mm -hmm. So an investor can buy the wholesale deal from us. They can use our funding. Then we, we, we are also working on project management, project management for a lot of investors Mm -hmm. because we do some flips here and there too. Uh, so we'll do project management for them. And then we're also a real estate brokerage, a full service broker. So then we can go ahead and list the property for you if you fix it up. Or if you buy a rental, then you can just use us as a property manager. Okay. So that way we don't have to take all the liability that the normal turnkey model does. Of You have to rehab it and do and make sure that you place a tenant in there before um, and, and then you turn it over to the to the homeowner. We mm-hmm. kind of break it up, let them, if they don't want to use us for the rehab, they can go use whoever and then come back and use the property management. But we we, ha- we want to be able to 
uh, service all investment arms. And then we're also working on, on working on getting a multifamily branch that's probably going to come in towards the end of the year, maybe early next year is when we're going to go full board on that. Commercial. Exciting, man. So yeah. you, you've got the brokerage you mentioned. Do you, is that brokerage set up just to work with your investor clients that you're bringing through that? Or are you working with retail clients? Buyers? No, we also work with retail clients. So we have okay. retail agents and um, we, we either, you know, a lot of times we get leads that are like, hey, I want to sell. But, you know, it doesn't work numbers for us. Uh, mm-hmm. So we'll, we'll, we'll throw it over to our retail agents. They'll list it. Uh, we had one recently that it's an older couple. And great high end area of, of of Orlando, and we sold it for five hundred eighty two thousand. Made Jeez. five. They gave us five percent commission on it. It was, <laughs> you know, it was a it was a lead that we made eighteen. Uh, no, was it fourteen thousand two hundred dollars? Was the commission at the end? Yep. And normally it would just go. It would be a dead lead to a lot of people. So it does that. We also do a lot of Facebook marketing specifically just for our agents and. Mm. Uh, we're getting buyers. We just closed uh, two deals in the past month from uh, just retail ads, just for Facebook. That's all we do is just Facebook ads, and we drive them, drive them to the website, and to our, and, and convert them. Mm-hmm. Dude, so, so I, I started the podcast with kind of a, a a big cool announcement. I mean, I'm not the one who announced it. You announced it on Facebook, but uh, what was the big milestone you guys hit this last year, dude? And that's crazy exciting because hitting this milestone is hard. It's not easy. <laughs> so what's the big milestone? That, so that I want to break it, apart how you got there here in a little bit. So our milestone for 2018, we finished with 1.4 million in gross revenue, which that's was crazy, man. Like th- there's, there's some stats out there and I can't remember exactly what it is, but something, the effect of, um, the, the percentage of businesses that make it to a million is so low. I mean, it's like 5% of businesses or something like that ever make it to a million in revenue. So you're, you're in the top 5% of like all businesses in yeah. uh, revenue, which is amazing. Yeah. And, and, then, and, and, and we grew really fast. Like I think we now, uh, I feel that we grew faster than we were ready to grow, mm. which I, you know, sometimes you wouldn't think that that'd be a bad thing, but it, it can, it can't hurt you. We went in 2017, our gross revenue, which was our first year, we started in March of 2017 and, uh, we finished with $330,000 gross. Okay. Yep. Then last year we, we blew up to 1.4 million. I mean, that was, that's crazy how much more of our revenue we get that yep. <laughs> we couldn't believe it. So our goal and our goal for this year is 3 million. So okay. we're going to see if we can keep that growth going on. I love it. So, so we're going to, I, I want to hear in a bit, I want to break apart what you guys did between the year where you hit 300,000 and you hit 1.4. We're going to break that apart here in a second, but let me go all the way back, man. So you guys started in 2017. What were you doing before you dove in and became a real estate investor? What were you doing for work? So I was a firefighter. Okay. Uh, I was a firefighter for since I graduated high school, Mm -hmm. Uh, went straight into the academy, got a job at 19. uh, And I did that for 12 years. That was it. So you're a firefighter. So where, where did you come across real estate investing? And dude, I don't, I don't know what it is. It's funny. I actually know a lot of firefighters who had became real estate investors. So Do you know what? Going to the masterminds and all these events, I just keep running into firefighters yeah. constantly. All the time is like, yeah, I used to be one and stuff. Uh, one of my top, top, top Swigerty mm-hmm. from Yellow Letters HQ, he's, he used to be a firefighter. Me and him that's how we connected. We just started talking about it. He, he's like, Hey, I used to be a firefighter and everything. And he's, he's awesome. So yep. there's a couple of people that I, I talked to that I didn't, I didn't realize how many of us there were that just made the switch over to, to real estate. I guess it has to do with our, our schedule. You know, uh, we gotcha, yep. I, I used to, I worked 24 hours and then I was off for 48 hours. Mm-hmm. And then every third week they gave me a day off. So I only worked eight days a month. Mm, <laughs> I had plenty of free time. Dude, I, I never put two and two together there, but you're spot on. You're spot on because a lot of people that that will hit that will hit me up and they'll say, "Hey, I'm working a full time job. How do I start a business on the side?" And they're usually the nine to five. But if if you've got 48 hours off, I mean, you're probably catching up on some sleep at the start, but then you've got a day or two days that you can jam on work and get some things going. Exactly, exactly. And so you know, we we do sleep at the station. So if you happen to be at a slower station or it's a slow night that you're not up, you actually wake up the next morning. Like yep. you sleep all night and you can get to work right away. So 
So, so you were a firefighter. Where, when did you start looking into real estate and, and how, the, how were you introduced to it? So it, it all started back in 2008, you know, uh, when the crash happened. Mm. They froze our, our raises at the fire department, uh, just like most public service throughout the country. Because, mm. And I just, I, I accidentally stumbled onto Rich Dad Poor Dad. Mm-hmm. And I read the book and it just completely blew my mind and opened my mind to, you know, I, I, I was under the, the impression, go to school, get a job, retire, that, you know, like everybody else. That's what yep. my mom told me and everything growing up. And I read that book and I was like, oh my God, I've been lied to. <laughs> I've been lied to my whole life. Yeah. I want to go ahead and flip, do real estate. I want to flip houses because majority of uh, millionaires make their money on real estate. Yep. So uh, after that, I just dug in and started reading about everything I could about flipping houses, rentals, uh, commercial real estate, and uh, and then eventually stumbled onto wholesaling and and just kept just kept learning about it as much as I could. So so to get your first deal done, were, were you still at the fire department when you got your first deals done? What what did the first deal look like, dude? So how did you get the first deal? What did it look like? Were you still working at the fire department? So I actually, so I actually tried doing real, uh, the wholesaling thing by myself, Mm -hmm. uh, no mentor, nothing, you know, just YouTube and everything. And one of the biggest things is I I really had no guidance. I didn't have anywhere to go. I didn't know what to do. Uh, and I, I got my real estate license Mm -hmm. one day because my wife, my, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time was like, Hey, you know, here's a Groupon deal for your real estate license. Why don't you just do it? I was like, okay, I got nothing to lose. I did it. And one day I ended up finding an ad on Craigslist for uh, an investment company looking for acquisitions and sales agents. Mm -hmm. I actually ended up going there and started working for them Mm -hmm. as a, uh, as a sales agent, Mm -hmm. a dispositions agent, made my first sale within a month and a half. And quickly moved over to their acquisition side, and I just started acquiring properties and learning how to do transactions, how to manage them, how to talk to sellers, how to talk, how to uh, run com- comps on the MLS. We offered a lot on the MLS too, so working, doing double closings, working with REO properties, working short sales. Um, I, I just started. I just learned all that, and I and I, I did that. My first year, I made fifty. 50,000. And then the next year I made another, I made my first six figures just specifically from that, just as an agent for them, Mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, so, so, so what the transition look like from that to going off on your own then? Cause now you've got both sides of it, right? You've got the acquisition side, you've got the disposition side of it. So you kind of got to learn, uh, how to, how to do both sides. And I have a question that's going to come up later around a fear that I see a lot of investors talking about when they're looking at building out teams, like, what happens if I bring someone and teach them everything and then leave them their competitors? So we're going to bring that up later um, just to see what your current perspective is on it. Um, I've got my own philosophies on it. But so when, when did you then start to make a decision to go, okay, you know, I, I think I can do this stuff and I'm going to go on my own and try it out? So uh, about a, after a year and a half of being there, um, I, I started, it started getting harder finding properties on the MLS. Mm-hmm. This was around the end of 2015. So that's when I actually bought the Sean Terry uh, course mm-hmm. and I learned how to do it. So uh, I started sending out mailers on my own direct mail and answering phone calls for sellers. Um, and I started getting, and I got a deal, brought it into the company. Uh, we sold it <clears throat> and, you know, I kind of felt like, Hey, I, I, I'm, I'm paying for my leads I'm doing all this work. I think I can do this on my own. So I, I just, uh, around the end of December, 2015, I left and I went on my own That's and you, failed. <laughs> and failed. So, all right. And, and the rest of the story. So what did that look like? So you, you left that company, you're on your own saying, man, I can do this. I've got the skill sets to it. What happened next? Um, so, you know, I, I, I just started sending out marketing and, and, and stuff, but, I didn't pay attention to my list as well. Mm. And then also I, I didn't pay attention to my sales script. Mm -hmm. Right. 
That's usually, that's probably, I think the hardest thing for a lot of people, especially brand new is how to talk to sellers. What do you say to sellers? What do you, how do you negotiate with sellers? You know? And on top of that, I'm not a, I'm not a salesperson. I actually don't like being on the phones. It's yeah. actually like, like, that's not my personality. That's not the best thing. I, I hate rejection. I hate being told no. Mm. So I was, I was just talking to sellers, sending out marketing and I ended up running out of money. Mm. That's really what happened. Luckily I was still at the fire department. So, you know, all my bills and everything was covered, but um, I just had no extra marketing money and I didn't get any more deals. So what was next, man? So you, you obviously didn't tuck your tail between your legs and, and, and go back and quit. I mean, you, you, had, you had a moment where you had to make a decision and yeah. we all know how it's ended up at least, at least uh, to this point. So what'd you do next? So I actually ended up going to another company and working at, again as an agent for them. You know, I kind of, um, it's one thing that a lot of people don't do. I actually sucked up my pride and said, okay, I failed. Um, I have another opportunity with a, another big wholesaling company here in Orlando, I know I, I just need the support. So I went back there and just started doing the same thing I was doing before, acquiring on the MLS. And in the meantime, what I did was I, I worked on my systems. I worked on my processes. I, I learned more sales skills, talking to sellers more, how to truly negotiate, came up with a script. I took everything that I, that I realized I failed at, and I worked on fixing those issues while still at the same time doing what I was uh, I was successful at, dude. So, so you talk about the script. If, if you remember back to that point, what were some of the things that that you that you changed when you were on the phone with sellers that made it work? Were, were there certain things you would say? It was it the way you started a call? Was it inflection? Like, kind of what were the overall things that you started to change that made it work better? The biggest thing that I realized was that the structure of the of the of the call, okay. right? Um, and controlling it, you know, when, when you get a seller and they're upset or they're, they, you know, they, you, you have different personalities. You have, you have drivers, you have expressives, you have amiables. And, and that was another part. I learned personality traits. So when I, you know, you get a driver that tells, calls in and says, Hey, I got this letter, um, that you want to buy my house. How much, you know, what are you going to offer me? Mm. And they're very aggressive, very strong. I realized that that's a driver okay, I have to come, I have to still stay on my script and, and go through it, even though they're trying to lead the conversation. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was one of the biggest keys that I learned on is to how to control the conversation when I'm, when, when, with the different personalities. And that really helped me out because at that point I didn't get flustered. I didn't get, oh my God, this guy's like, you know, over, overpowering me on the phone conversation. I, I didn't have a fear of, of, of not having the right numbers or anything because my numbers, I'm very good at my numbers on, mm -hmm. on rehabs, on, 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 um, running comps because I had already done it. My, my, so my worry was more of how to, when they tell you, Hey, I want a hundred thousand dollars and you know, you need to get it, how to, how to get it down without them rejecting it. That was, that was what I needed to work on. So uh, I'm going to throw it. This might work amazingly well. This might be terrible. So I'm going to throw a hypothetical at you here, man. So let's say there's a driver like you talked about. They give you a call. They're really trying to drive it and they throw out a number like that. Is there something like how would you deal with that now? What, what are some of those negotiation techniques that, that you might you might do to take back control of the combo? Oh man, our script now is even different than, than what I was doing. Yeah. So now, um, now the way we do it is we actually use the property comparables that have recently sold. Mm -hmm. And we tell them, Hey, are you familiar with this property at this address? Are you mm -hmm. familiar with this property at this address? It's sold for this amount. Yours is a little bigger. Yours is this, this amount. Um, and, and now that that's exactly how we get them to, mm -hmm understand where our numbers coming from rather than just saying, okay, I understand you want a hundred thousand, but I'm going to offer you 70 grand mm -hmm. with no reasoning behind them, not setting it up. They're just like, what, why? No, I think yeah. my house is worth a hundred thousand. But when you tell them, Hey, are you familiar with one, two, three main street? He's like, yeah, that's the street over. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a three bedroom house, just like yours. This one's fifteen hundred. Yours is fourteen hundred square feet, and it sold for sixty-five thousand dollars. Those facts they can't fight. 
Yep. You know, they can, yep. they can go look it up on Zillow themselves and realize it. And, you know, if they tell you, you know, sometimes they go, Hey, Oh yeah, well that one's, that one's not as nice as, as, as mine. It's like, okay, well, yours still doesn't have granite. Yours doesn't have anything updated. Mm-hmm. What makes your house special that makes me want to buy it for more than the 65 grand, yep. and, you know, and, and that kind of leaves them in a point where they can't fight the data. Mm-hmm. And they either tell you yes, I can do that, or no, I can't do seventy. How about eighty? How about ninety? But they're more receptive to the to the lower offer because you have things backing up the reasoning why. And then we also use our underwriter. You know, <laughs> our underwriter is 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 non-existent, but <laughs> uh, we always tell them, hey, uh, let me let me talk to my underwriter, or our underwriter came back and told me that this is the price that they can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the best that you can do. I, I try fighting for you. Uh, hold on. Let me call you back in like five minutes. And, you know, we call him back be like, Hey man, I went to bat for you and we went up another two or three grand and stuff like that. So that way they kind of feel that we're on their side and there's this third party person that's controlling uh, what our decision is. Gotcha. Versus putting all the blame on you. Uh, I, I love man. Dude, one thing, one thing you'd mentioned there too, is you brought in, so let's say in a driver there oftentimes, uh, decent they're oftentimes kind of more emotional type of people so if you can come in with logic right if you can come in with logic uh then that starts to speak to them and slow them down get them out of the emotional state into a logical state and and that's a really good tip i want people to write that down that uh, anytime you guys can get people into the logical state um you need to you need to touch on emotions and logic in a, in a good sales uh process but then the next thing too is what christian had mentioned i've been harping on this for years guys is he bought, he brought in and he added transparency to the process because one of the big one of the big things that a lot of investors struggle with is they go man like why am i not getting these deals oftentimes it's there's skepticism that the sellers have when they're calling right that's why the guy was aggressive there's skepticism and so if they have if they're skeptical you need to then pull back and be as transparent as you possibly can and that's going to release the skepticism because then they can put the pieces together and go oh i get it okay yeah it, that makes sense and that makes sense okay yeah that makes sense now my now your process is transparent so make sure you guys add transparency to the process just like christian mentioned there uh, i love it yeah. man a, a lot of times we'll get a homeowner that sells okay well you know the property across the street is on the market right now for this amount of money and they think that that's what their house is worth and we'll have a conversation with them and tell them okay well have you looked at it you know that one has it's been fully renovated it's got a pool mm-hmm. yours doesn't have a pool whatever different things and they usually realize that that's not how it is. You can't just go because your neighbor across the street is selling for this much, your house is worth. And uh, another tip, another quick thing that people don't realize is your Facebook is literally your company's reputation. Mm -hmm. So if you go on my company's Facebook page, we're always posting videos. We're always posting our deals that we sell. We're posting, I'm posting videos of us at houses, flipping houses and just the other day, we actually had a seller call us and said, hey, uh, you know, I got another offer. It was higher than yours. However, I just don't feel comfortable with them. I don't. Mm-hmm. I feel that there's something wrong with them. So my acquisitions agent actually told them, oh, well, you know, we're, 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 we're reputable. Go ahead and check out our Facebook page. You know, he's like, I already did. I've already yeah. seen what you guys do. I've, I've been on your Facebook page already. And I like you guys. I know what you guys are doing. You really do flip houses. I feel comfortable that you will close. Uh, so I'd rather, I'd rather take your offer versus them. And, and yep. he took our offer and it was it was $7,000 less than they were asking. Just yeah. because we actually built a brand on our Facebook and our Google. And, and a lot of people are not paying attention to that. And that is so huge now. Exactly, dude. It, it, that's such a good point. So I went to Google just now while you were chatting and doing the same thing. I, I'm the same thing, guys. I've been talking about this for years. So please do it because that's more and more proof that Christian threw at you that your sellers are doing this. And we that that's the that's the thing. If you do this, it actually makes the whole industry more credible. It makes mm-hmm. the industry more credible. It makes the industry it makes your job easier to to then guide people away from potentially a, a traditional home sale with an agent. But if you are an agent and a, and an investor, awesome. So I googled as as an example capital. Uh, real estate pros, and then up popped in, I put Orlando, but then up popped in there uh, as a suggested search is capital real estate pros reviews. So I clicked on those things, your Facebook, your Facebook uh, thing is number two. Let's see what is the number one deal. 
Uh, a carrot site, one of your carrot sites is, is the first ranking there. So number one, they're going to be kick, clicking on your carrot site and you've got your carrot site built out with good testimonials, good reviews, a good, clean, clear brand. It's a credible brand. And then number two is your Facebook page. And then number three is another carrot site of yours. And then it's your LinkedIn page, number six. Um, and then it's your realtor, realtor page, number eight. Like you're, you're going in there and you've got basically all of page one dominated. And I call that, I call that co controlling the conversation. Anytime you can control the conversation, the online conversation of what's happening when people are searching for your name or for your brand, that puts, that gives you a big edge. And if you can get reviews on your Google stuff, when people are searching it, that shows the stars and reviews, get reviews on your Facebook, that gives you an edge. And people, dude, people are always wanting to go, what's the next great, latest, greatest piece of marketing or whatever. I'm like, if you're already doing marketing, the next greatest thing is to build up your credibility because you're currently losing deals. Right now, my biggest focus on is, is brand building, you know, mm -hmm. uh, not just the company, but my personal brand too. Uh, that is, that is really what I'm working on because people, I, I just think of it as what, if I'm going to a brand new restaurant or any new place, what do I do? Mm -hmm. I'm Googling it. I'm yeah. trying to find out. And, and you know what I'm Googling? I'm not Googling for the good reviews. I'm Googling for the bad reviews. Mm -hmm. Even when I'm on Amazon to buy a product, I'm looking for the bad reviews. Mm -hmm. So one thing with our company is customer service. We always want to make sure our sellers are very well taken care of and they have a good experience. And the same goes for our investors because we have two different sides. We have two different customers. You can't just treat your sellers good and then just put your investors in bad deals that they're not going to make money. Right now, we're working on testimonials from video testimonials from a couple of our flippers that are that are getting ten twenty thousand dollars above even the arv that we gave them mm. you know they're good, doing good rehabs and they're loving the properties that we sell them right now our, our, our properties usually sell within 24 hours and between five to fifteen thousand dollars above asking uh now we have a, a, a pretty elaborate disposition process that mm. has allowed us to it but but I, I can't remember the the last time that we sold the property for for less than our asking price uh just because we are getting providing a good quality product to our investors that they know they're either going to get great rentals or they're going to get good flips. Mm -hmm. Dude, I, I love it. So I, I kind of want to break down some, some of the, the pieces here. So right before we hopped on, I'm like, dude, if it's cool, we're going to break apart, you know, your marketing mix. So what took you from 300,000 to 1.4? And I've got a couple of your carrot sites pulled up and I'm, I just looked at the lead numbers, dude. So you've got like 3,200 buyer leads on your cheaporlandohomes.com site. Um, you've got hundreds of seller leads on one of them. And I, I, know, I know you're doing Google pay-per-click. You're doing um, things on Facebook. Uh, you're doing a lot of offline marketing. That's where most of your deals are coming from. So let's kind of break apart this. What, what's the breakdown of your, of your marketing currently or your marketing for 2018 that got you to the 1.4? And what did you change from 2017 to 2018 that essentially uh, quad, more than quadrupled your revenue in that year? So... Our, our marketing, like I said, in, in 2018, it was, was cold calling. We added in the beginning of the year, um, uh, around February, March. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then direct mail were our two top performers. Cool. And really the only difference we did was we just sent more mail out mm -hmm. and, and we actually, and we just started cold calling. Mm -hmm. Now that it wasn't, it wasn't anything great insane or anything major uh we also switched our mail houses over to yellow letters hq and we went straight postcards so we don't really send out um uh, yellow letters anymore we just send out postcards and the reason for that is one todd at yellow letters has great postcards i love them mm -hmm. and my thing is, so I get mail too because of my, my properties from people that are, are, are just mailing. And as soon as I see an envelope, I, a lot of times I don't even open it. You know, if, if it looks like spam, I throw it out. But with a postcard, no matter what, even if I throw it out, I at least read it and I know yeah. what they want. Mm -hmm. So spending the less money and getting people to actually see it. It was, it was just saving me more, more. And instead what I did was I just upped up, the mailers that I did. So instead of spending sixty dollars on a on one piece of yellow uh, yellow letter, I was able to spend forty cents, and I could send out two for for a little bit more. Gotcha, dude. So what what's the add context for it? So currently, what's your volume that you're sending out monthly right now for for direct mail? 
So right now for direct mail, we're sending out 25,000 pieces a month. Okay. And what's the cadence? Is it, you know, five, 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 or kind of like what, what's your cadence on how you're dropping that mail? Uh, yeah, we split it up. We have, we have seven, uh, 16,000 goes out, uh, over one week. Mm -hmm. Then the next week we send out five. Okay. And then the next week we send out two and three. And the reason for that is because the, it trickles down and some calls still keep coming in. And, and so we send out our, our bulk mail at one time. The, the majority of it and stuff. So, okay. And then what's, what's, uh, what's one of those 20, 25. So for a month of 25,000 pieces, what's that cost you for direct mail right now for the postcards, for the stamps and all that kind of stuff. What's that cost you for a drop? Uh, that is uh 13,000. Okay. So 13 K and then yep. on average, what are you getting back from that? How many deals do you end up closing from that? And then what's your average profit per deal? So right now we're converting around 22 uh, contracts per deal, uh, leads per contract and yeah. our average return. So each one is different. Um, last year uh, with cold calling, we actually, our cost per lead was 46 bucks mm -hmm. and we had an ROI of 1600%. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then our, <laughs> our direct mail, our, our cost per lead was uh, 78 sent mm -hmm. uh, 78 dollars and we had an average roi of 820 okay so basically let's gonna work some math here so you said about one in 22 your cost per lead is 78 so times that by 22 so it's about you know about about 1500 to two thousand dollars maybe a little bit more for a cost per deal so yeah 1700 to two thousand dollars for a cost per deal and then what's your average profit per deal in that market right now our average profit per uh, 18,883. Okay. So cool. So 18 K and that I, I, is that before the, this cost or after the cost for the, so that, that was overall for cold calling our average actual spread was 24,000. And then okay. for direct mail, our actual spread was 14,000. Cool. And, it, dude, and that's pretty common. We, we see that a lot where, where direct mail produces amazing results. You're going to see a little bit sm smaller margins. Uh, search engine optimization, and sometimes PPC too gets gets higher margins oftentimes. We, we'll oftentimes hear from people where like their biggest deals come from online oftentimes, not all the time, oftentimes. And then uh, cold calling is crushing it still. Like cold calling, just really good, really consistent, good margins, all that stuff. So uh, you're turning about 2K into um, uh, 1700 bucks into a Fourteen thousand dollar deal, which I take that I take that turn all day long. Yep. And then on the uh, on the cold calling side of it, your your cost per your cost per leads a little bit lower than that, right? Is that what you're saying? It's a little bit lower, but yeah. your profit's higher, so your spread's bigger there. And now uh, you mentioned earlier, and I know this from when we when we met in Dallas that you're having some pretty darn good su success with Google Pay Per Click. And uh, it was funny we were talking at dinner, and you were talking about that you were, you were working with. Uh, a guy in my team before he became a part of my team. And then you went and tried something new and then you're back to him, which is awesome. Now that he's a part of my team, he's been, been with us for about uh, two and a half years now. But um, what are you doing on the PPC side and what kind of mix is that? What, what, what does that account for in your total deal size? So if you guys did a 1.4 mil, how much of that revenue accounted for the PPC side? So off the 1.4 mil, the PPC side last year was... Uh, 238 okay 238k and but when we looked into it part of it was um and, and like i said when we grew so fast mm -hmm. we grew faster than we can manage it and and now we're we're realizing that we had pretty big holes in our in our process so what we did realize was that in 2017 our ppc conversion was 15 leads hmm. per deal Mm -hmm. And it was our top producing mark market. Uh, we had our average spread was was again around twenty four thousand yep. dollars, and our ROI was was twelve hundred percent on on uh, PPC, and we were spending about a hundred and seventy seven on on leads okay. per lead. But then in twenty eighteen, it actually dropped, mm. and our our conversion dropped to twenty eight leads per contract, mm. and our our um, spread went down lower. And the reason we actually found that out was because our agents weren't, um, getting on the phones right away. Gotcha. 
Yep. We actually found out that it was a conversion problem on our end, on our, on my team's end, that was causing the, the 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 downward on the PPC. So that's what we're working on, dude. That and that's so common. So don't 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 feel bad about it. Cause we'll hear it. We'll hear it quite often. Where you know we're working with amazing investors and like these things just aren't converting. And what we end up doing is, oh, dude, I, I was talking with one of our team members uh, today about this, and they're like, I pick up the phone and called like I, I picked up the phone and called their number and I also submitted a lead through their thing. And he's like, I got a phone call seven hours later. And um and then we we got a hold of that guy and we're like, all right guys, here's your issue. You you need to call these things back immediately. And what what we'll tell people is, is take the phone and at least to start, um oftentimes we have the entrepreneur do it to set to set that that um that cadence or have the best salesperson in your team. Have those darn leads texted directly to you. And then as soon as the lead comes in, um, go ahead and tap the, the, the text notification, tap the phone number, call them back immediately within a minute. Like you're, they're, still, they're still on our thank you page at that point. And then you can tell your real close ratio. And then after that, you create a process, get those text notifications to go to someone else. Of course, make sure that the, the CRM, uh, they're, they're keeping an eye on that. But the text notifications on your online leads are a big deal because right after, right after they, they submit the thing, uh, they're either going to go on with their day or they're going to hit the back button, go down Google and go, ah, what, like who else is in here? Like, oh, let me get, let me see that one too. And so if you're able to call them back immediately, that's a big gap, man. So you guys might be able to, you know, increase and, that by 50%, double it, who knows. And that's what we did now. So once I, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we, we, we found this towards the end of the year when we went back and looked and um, now, now our agents have, our top agent has text message. And I get mm-hmm. it, and I get it myself too. Cool. So, so as soon as I get it, if I don't hear them, they we have a chat, and they have to say, "I got it," you know, mm-hmm. I, "I got this one." And if I don't hear it within five minutes, I'm like, "Hey, who's got it?" Or I'm calling, you know. <laughs> and if you lose, and if you lose it, I, I'm, you're not getting commission on it. <laughs> you're not getting paid for it. I love it, dude. So, so I, I want to kind of open up this topic a little bit. So, you guys, uh, 2017, you got started, did a few hundred grand, which is amazing. The first year. Uh, more than quadruple. It's 1.4 million last year, which is amazing. You added on some new parts of the business. Um, you've got a, kind of a full suite of products now for your clients. You've got thousands of buyer leads in your carrot system. Um, what do you do on the buyer side of things to get leads over there? Because uh, you have 3,000 buyer leads over there. Websites converting really well for it. What are you doing to get buyers? Oh, man, man. So buyers. So, you know, a lot of investors let the buyers kind of go, you know, mm-hmm. they, they concentrate a lot. So my partner actually works the disposition side and we have a full process for it. So whenever a property goes out, we're, we're always running Facebook ads for mm-hmm. buyers every single day. And we're getting between 10 to 15 buyers daily. That's yep. that every single day, brand new buyers just signing up in our care and then they get automatically put into our CRM. And then our CRM already automatically adds them to the our, our MailChimp. Okay. On top of that, we post on Craigslist every day. Our VAs go ahead and just post our properties on Craigslist. And then we also go ahead and do, um, we call realtors. Mm-hmm. So, and we call cash buyers. We skip trace and call cash buyers. Okay, cool. And then we drop band signs, a lot of band signs. We drop probably 600 band signs a week just for buyers. Really? Yeah. Each one of our properties ha- gets 100 band signs per agent. So our, our, our agents each have their own call rail number because each agent has their own list, right? Mm-hmm. So we separate the list. We don't just do one big list. Okay. Uh, that way we know, hey, this is your buyer. You build relationship with it. Uh, you build relationship with this person. This is your personal company rep that you have versus just having one giant list and and everybody's just, hey, I'm calling this guy. I'm calling this guy. Uh, because by, with, working with investors, it's a relationship business. They, a lot of times it's if they like you. Yep. So our agents, uh, you know, have conversations with them, explain to them hard money, explain to them how to flip houses, uh, what rehab they should and shouldn't do, especially for the newer investors. And that builds a relationship and builds a trust where they, they, they come back because we don't just want an investor to buy a house one time. We want them to come back and buy and buy again. Now, one thing I don't do is I don't have just a specific, I know some people have like their top five or 10 investors that there's go-to guys. Um, I don't have any, I have no loyalty to buyers mm-hmm. because unfortunately buyers have no loyalty to us. Yep. 
and I tell this, I walk to the office and I tell them, you know, um, everybody, uh, these buyers are going to find, are going to buy a deal from the other wholesaler, the competition down the street or, or you, even if they love you, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's a deal, a deal. So we've built our process to build relationships, but at the same time, keep them at arm's length to where, you know, I don't, I don't need you. I need you, but I don't need you. Yeah. It, it's, it's kind of the thing. Do we, we had at, at our last carrot camps, so this conversation came up a bunch at our last carrot camp. So our last carrot camp had uh, Max Maxwell was there and Tony, and then uh, Matt Miller who heads up the, the new Western um, acquisitions branch in LA. They, that month that they were here at carrot camp, they bought 30 properties that one month in LA. Um, then you have Daniel DiGiacomo in Baltimore and it's like Dave Brown, like a bunch of amazing people in this room. And that came up because they were asking Matt. Matt walked through their proprietary process, and I can't walk through it. We got it filmed, but we can't put it out because we had to sign something saying we couldn't put it out. Uh, but he walked through their proprietary process that, that enables them to get much higher than the average wholesaler or flippers getting in that market. And it was similar. It's kind of a highest and best type of model. And one of the biggest mistakes that, that he sees, and, and, and you see it too, and we see it all the time too, is people kind of get in bed at those handful of buyers. And like you said, the, those buyers are going to, they're not in your, they're, your, they're not in your pocket, you're in their pocket, basically. Yeah. And That's oftentimes the investor thinks, man, I've got these people in my pocket, they buy anything I put out there. It's no, it's the other way around. Uh, you're in their pocket. And when you, when you make them compete and, and you put deadlines on them and Brad Chandler at the carrot camp before that, he said, we started doing an eBay model where basically there's a buy it now price. That's really high. And then there's a, then there's the highest and best below that. And he said, what happened is we were able to get, uh, it was like 10 or 15% more on average with their properties by having the buy it now price, just like eBay has. And so he's like, got buy it now, which is jacked up there. And some people will buy it because like, I just want the property. I don't want to have to dicker back and forth with negotiation, bam, buy it now. Um, or he makes them then negotiate. And he's been able to, uh, to ramp up their, their average profit per deal in a big you way. Know the, the, so our, our dispositions process, um, and I made a post about it recently, mm -hmm. is, is, is that. So we did, we look, when I created it, I looked at the buy it now price. But one thing that I didn't like about the buy it now price was that you never knew what people were willing to pay. Mm -hmm. True. So, yep. you know, you, you could be like, oh man, let's, I'm, I'm good with $5,000. And you just put it at 5,000 over. And this guy was willing to pay 15. Yep. So. Yep. We have a highest and best now. Mm -hmm. When a property comes in, it, it goes out. The moment we get our first offer, we then do 24 hours for everybody else to go ahead and put in their highest and best offer. Mm -hmm. We don't give price. We don't do bidding wars. We don't call buyers back and say, hey, I got another offer for this much. Do you want to beat it? Do you want to match it? It's just, hey, tell me what you want to offer. Yep. If it can be below asking, it can be at asking, or it can be above asking. And now we're getting $15,000 above asking on a property. It, it, the past two properties we sold, we've gotten 15 and we didn't even think of that. It, it was, uh, it was funny. The guy that bought the last one, he offered 4,000 on the previous one and lost it because somebody came in and offered 10, mm -hmm. um, 10 above asking. So this time he came in and offered 10 above asking and we're like, okay, cool. We got you down. We'll let you know. Call back like five hours later. And he's like, he told my agent, he's like, man, I can't stop thinking about this house. I do not <laughs> want to lose it. Bump my price up for $5,000 more. He's like, are you sure? He's like, yes, yeah. I want $5,000 more. I'll pick. I really want this house. Mm -hmm. We're like, okay, he won it. <laughs> and we didn't have to bid him against. He was comfortable. The thing I love about it is that they're happy. Yep. You know, if, if, they're not feeling that we pressured them into it is, you know, it's their decision. And, and that's the, the most important thing because at the end of the day, they're not going to blame us if, if something happens, you know, if they, they feel that, Hey, the rehab, you know, I didn't make as much money as I expected. You know, I was like, I didn't tell you to offer that much. Yeah. And, and, and it's a win all around at that point. Right. Yeah. Because, because then they're, they're like, so they don't feel like they're being manipulated back and forth on it. Like, Oh my gosh, they wore me down. It's like, no, I had a chance to made an offer and, and it made it or it didn't. I love it, man, dude. So a couple, a couple more questions. We'll wrap this puppy up is, uh, so 2019, we're recording this in 2019 right now, uh, the first end of the first quarter. Um, what are you guys doing differently today? I know, I know in many parts of the, uh, of the, of the country, people say things are softening. Other people are saying it's a normalization and, and they're not getting those above asking price offers. I'd talked to another guy, uh, Brian, Brian Frost, who, uh, 
um, was a carrot camp uh, member as well. He still has a full-time job, but it flips a bunch of houses. And he's like, man, mid last year, we had a slowdown. We couldn't like, we had to lower prices. He said it picked back up. So there's all kinds of things happening in the, in the market right now. What are you guys seeing and what's, and how has it affected your business in 2019, if any good or bad? So we definitely have seen a slowdown. Uh, one thing that we've done now is our ARV is a lot more conservative okay. when we run it. Before, you know, we we could account for a little bit of appreciation. You know, we let's say we we saw uh, a comparable that sold for one for two fifty five, and another one that sold for two sixty five. You know, uh, we would be able to say, hey, this is probably going to be at two sixty five or or go up to maybe two seventy. You know, mm -hmm. by the time. So n now we we would be able to kind of play with the numbers a little bit more now we're going and we're staying at the 255 gotcha. right or 260 and and we're not we're not counting for appreciation we're counting for either staying flat or going down just a tad bit and that's mm -hmm. how we're running the numbers also we've uh we've increased our rehab calculation so we have a, a specific set rehab number based on the type of rehab that they have to do and that's how my agents are able to make quick analysis uh and make offers over the phone because we don't go to any properties we don't mm -hmm. my agents aren't allowed to go see a property unless it's locked up okay um so everything's done over the phone and so we bumped up our 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 pricing that formula that we use to uh do rehabs and that just builds a better buffer mm -hmm. too for the investor and it's also what helps us uh, be able to get higher offers on it because the investors are like, hey, I can make more money. I can do this. So, so we're, just, we're just trying to provide a product that is consistent with the market. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not telling you, hey, the market continues to go up. And yes, you can make 270, 275 on this house, even though there's no comps. We're not trying to set the record on comps we're making sure that the comps are there and we're we're taking into account the fact that it's either going to stay at that price or maybe drop just a little bit when we run numbers i like it and, and earlier you, you mentioned so at the previous company before this company you did a lot of mls stuff you started doing uh, your own prospecting and you're doing mls stuff now has the mls stuff started to to get harder these days are you still heavily in mls um kind of where's that at for you so <laughs> the MLS has been hard for years. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually, it, we're, we're starting to see more inventory just okay. staying on there, which it, I'm excited for because that just means that the real estate agents that, that we're getting sellers, you know, hey, yeah, I can definitely get you that price and stuff like that. Um, now that the stuff's sitting on the market, these sellers still need to sell fast, mm -hmm. whatever reason it is, but if it's not moving now, they're being becoming more motivated sellers that we can work on. And now they're willing to accept our lower offer. Gotcha. Cool. So that's, so that's, a, that's a good thing. And I want everyone to listen to that because just like everything, I, I have my whiteboard back there, but um, basically there's ebb and flow in marketing. And I've done a bunch of videos on this lately and I want people to recognize that there is an ebb and flow in the types of marketing. And uh, you know, six, seven years ago, MLS was amazing. Like you were saying, it's like everything MLS was amazing. Then it started to get harder and harder and harder as inventory shrank, time on market shrank. And now as it's going to start to go a little bit the other way, like Christian's saying, there's going to be more opportunities there. There's the ebb and flow while that was well that was starting to go down a little bit that's when cold calling and stuff started to go up because not as many people were using that marketing method and the one that's constant out of all of them cold calling is going to do this too as more and more people use it people are going to stop answering the phones and rvms come in so people were crushing it cold calling a year ago some of them have switched to rvms and you're going to even see that happen right so the one that's consistent is going back to what uh christian had mentioned before people go online to search for this stuff no matter what marketing you're doing guys they're all going online and that's the one if we look at the data the one and only marketing method that continues to stay level and or continues to grow so invest in the online side guys even if your main marketing methods are cold calling or mls or direct mail or especially invest in them uh and like like christian said get a facebook page up start posting good activity on there uh, get a website up if it's with carrot amazing if it's not find something that converts well works great on mobile and get credibility up there uh, so you can then <clears throat> start to capture that traffic um, guys do that uh, make sure you guys you guys look at the ebb and flow of marketing but the online side has to be constant and it's gonna be a big part of your game so moving into this year man what are your goals for 2019 um, what, what are you guys shooting for this year 
So for 2019, uh, you know, we're, we're definitely looking to do 3 million in gross. Um, yep. You know, uh, we're looking to expand to different markets. Like um, we're looking to expand into Tampa, mm -hmm. expand into Southern California. Uh, we're working actually to kind of start a, a, a semi franchise with uh, an investor out in Detroit, hmm. uh, where we kind of, kind of support them and use our brand. But, you know, um, it's, we're, we're working on it. We're, we're trying to figure out how to do a franchise, but, um, and also I think North Jersey, we're looking to go into North Jersey and stuff like that. Okay. Cool. And definitely, uh, increasing the, 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 the uh private lending the hard mm -hmm. money lending arm and just growing the other departments that we're starting work on stuff that's i i love it man and one, one thing we see that's really common too with people that are doing really well and especially as a market kind of tightens up a little bit inventory does <clears throat> is they look for opportunities either in different add-on businesses like you have done how do we how do we capture more of that experience you know it's not just selling the investor the property but it's rehab and 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 the whole the whole experience you've captured that and then the next thing is can we do the same thing in different markets so i, I love that i love that your proof positives that model that you 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 get down you niche in you do really really well you add on more marketing pieces to it then you go how do we serve the same client with more parts of it and then you go if we want to expand further now how do we do it in different parts of the area uh in different parts of the country so yeah, i love my, it man that right there's a model i love it yeah my partner has a <laughs> he has a funny analogy that he uses and he says you know if it, it, it's like we buy the cow and a lot of people just eat the filet out of it and throw the rest of the cow out mm -hmm. you know there's still so much more that you can do and make money on the same deal versus just saying okay let's move on mm -hmm. and and so that that's kind of one of the things that he challenges me on is mm -hmm. is figuring out how to make more money on the same lead over and over again instead of just increasing marketing increasing more direct mail how can we use that same list and make sure that we squeeze all the juice out of the lemon before mm -hmm. we move on to the next one Dude, I love it. I love it, man. Christian, man, I'm so proud of you. Uh, like I said, it was cool being able to meet you in Dallas and just kind of follow you along the way and and uh, be the the little part of your journey that that we are. And just it's really cool seeing uh, that happen. You know, I I love the fact that people uh, have goals and have dreams. And even though you, you had some stumbling blocks along the way, like you said, you you went out on your on your own first of all, and it didn't work. And then you went back to the you, you went back to the drawing board. You didn't quit. You said I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna try it from another angle, and you did. And it, and it worked and you're, you're going to continue finding things that don't work. You know, we see them all the time at care. Like, Whoa, that didn't work. And that oh. cost me a bunch of money, but now I know it doesn't work. <laughs> well, do and, uh, and, and, you know, you asked me earlier, uh, what, I, what I thought about, um, training your competition. Oh yeah. 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 I don't, my, my mindset is different. We don't hire anybody that wants to do wholesale. We don't want to mm -hmm. hire anybody that wants to do real estate investing. It's strictly, uh, we're changing our entire hiring process. We're mm -hmm. adding non-compete agreements. We're adding different things. And we want employee mindset people. It's, And we're, we've broken up the positions to the point where you we literally make the puzzle harder for you to learn it. Mm -hmm. You know? So, so that person's on the acquisition side, but acquisition side only as an example, or, or disposition side, but disposition side only. Uh, exactly. Right. right? Okay. So the acquisition person's just, just acquisitions. They don't know how to build a buyer's list. Mm -hmm. uh, the buyer, the disposition guys don't know how to acquire. Nobody knows how do we do marketing. Only mm -hmm. I and my partners know our marketing, our list mm -hmm. that we do, uh, the, the schedule that we use, um, our transaction coordinator, handles the entire transaction so our acquisitions person doesn't know how to manage transactions mm. um we've actually even broken up the transaction uh the acquisitions position into into somebody that takes inbound calls and then the acquisition manager that closes and he doesn't even go out to the property to see it uh we have another outside person and they're the ones that go and analyze the rehab. So they know how to do rehab, but they don't know how to do comps. Mm -hmm. you know? And we've just, we just completely destroyed it because what ended up happening was at towards the end of the year, our entire acquisitions team left. Uh, one, one guy had a few deals and he said, I can go do this on my own. Um, and then our other agent, uh, she also same thing. Mm -hmm. She started having a lot of success and figured I can do this on my own. Mm -hmm. 
saw the spreads that we make and she's like, well, I'm only getting a portion of this. I, I can do it on my own and get the full thing. And so, so, um, so she left. Uh, so we, we had to start back up at zero again. And so now we're bringing in new people that are a different mindset and everything. Cause you, you, I'm glad you said that. Cause I remember, uh, same thing in Facebook post a couple weeks ago where, where you had mentioned that you'd mentioned that you guys have rebuilt part of your company and you're coming back stronger, uh, stronger than ever, which, which yeah. is, which is awesome. And sometimes dude, I, I did a, a podcast on this a couple weeks ago that, um, sometimes you have to to go down before you can go up. It could be it could be bank account. Like let, let's say um, your bank has to go down. You have to make a big investment. You have to do this. You have to do that. It doesn't always have to be money. It could be something else. But in in some respects, before you can really break that that crust, you've got to then go down, and then you can rebuild with a stronger foundation. And it sounds like that's what you guys are doing. Which, yeah, that's uh, exactly which is what we're doing. You know, uh, our 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 acquisitions process is different now mm. since from two months ago our script is different now from two months ago our follow-up sequence is different now um everything we we had we sat down and and saw holes and we're like how can we fix this how can we make sure that we have this set because we can't expand to other other uh markets without making sure that our foundation is set and yep. so now now that's what we've worked on and it, it it's starting to pick back up to the point where it's, it's going to be even better than, than last year. I mean, our new guy is, is locking up. Um, he just locked up five, five this past week oh, sweet. Five different contracts, you know, and then he's only been on for two weeks. <laughs> the first week I, you know, our training process even changed. I, I trained them. I, I'm, I'm, I trained them completely different now than I trained the people before. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's definitely, I, I tell my wife, it's like a slingshot, you know, you have to go back before you can be thrown mm -hmm. forward. So, so I agree, man, we definitely have to sometimes in business go go backwards. So you can definitely go to a whole nother level. Dude. So I want to wrap it with this. Um, I'm on your carrot site. You're so, so my Orlando house site and, uh, the way you've built out your client reviews, you've got your Facebook rating uh, thing on there. You've got amazing testimonials on there, swapped out pictures. And, and the big thing I want people to take away here is there, there's a few big takeaways. Okay. Number one is have a good marketing mix. Okay. Even people that I was talking with Tyler Ford the other day, a guy that does three or four deals a month just with SEO. And I've been telling him for years, I'm like, dude, you got to do something else too. You got to mix in something else. And, and even though I'm like the online marketing guy, I think you should be doing offline stuff. And if you're doing offline stuff, you should be doing online stuff. So you can have a good marketing mix and they, they feed each other, but also the online feeds the offline. It builds credibility, helps you close more deals from your offline. Number two is, uh, is that last little tip at the end that as you're building your business, make sure that you're structuring in a way that can scale. And it's not something that it's not something that is fragile and could fall apart if one or two people left. So that's something that Christian's doing there. And I think that the, the third biggest thing, man, is just, uh, we were talking about this right before we hit, hit recording this, that nothing you're doing is, is, uh, and, and this is common, obviously, like that's usually the people that are crushing it. They're not doing, they're not working magic. They're just consistent. <laughs> They're consistently executing. They're finding some things that don't work and they go, okay, that didn't work. Let's adjust it. And then they invest heavier in things that do work. Like you mentioned with direct mail, it's like, it works. Let's just do more of it. Um, and then you keep on finding other ways to amplify what you're already doing. And, and you, you use the, the opportunities where you're having a setback as a learning opportunity, not an opportunity to quit. So guys, everything that Christian walked through is something that you guys can do every single thing. You just got to be consistent. You don't give up when, when you run out of budget that first time, like he did, uh, he didn't give up. He ran out of budget, went back. I'm going to learn more. And I'm going to go do it again. And, uh, that's, that's what gets you to hitting 1.4 million in your second year. So yeah. man, great work. I uh, love it. Anyway, we can support you along the way as you go into new markets. Um, that's something that we've helped tons of big investors do online. How do you then take the website and go into new markets and, uh, and what's the strategy there? So just hit me up. Love to walk you through that, man. But thank you for showing up to the Caracast. Any parting words for everyone listening to this? Um, I just, I just want to let everybody know that, you know, one of the main things that is going to drive you is your mindset. Mm -hmm. um, you definitely have a, a routine. Uh, find a way that to stay positive because this business isn't easy. You will, you can be at the top one moment and all of a sudden realize that you're going back down um, mm -hmm. and you have to find a way to stay positive and, and keep going because 
if not, you're, you're just not, you're, you're going to want to quit. So, you know, I meditate and daily I go to sleep, listen to meditation music. Cool. Uh, I go to the gym. Uh, sometimes I don't feel like going to the gym and I don't go. Uh, I, I, I did a story about it that it's, it's not about doing what everybody else is doing. It's, it's about doing what makes you happy. You know, we all get into business to be an entrepreneur, to have freedom. And a lot of times we get caught up, you know, saying, reading, oh, this person wakes up at four, this person wakes up at five. So I got to do it to be successful. And then that's not really it. You know, you, you can wake up whenever you want to wake up because that's really what we want to be as entrepreneurs. But when you're up, you better, you better work hard. You yep. know, you better not be up and be on Facebook. Like you better be making sure Every day I have, I have my goals and I have my things to do and I make sure that that list is completed. And Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I might do work for four or five hours during the day, but it's more effective than anybody that's in the office for eight, 10 hours. I'm just laser focused during those hours. So. Dude, so that little segment right there, we're going to cut that and we're going to, we're going to take that and put it out as its own little piece because more and more people need to hear that, man. More and more people need to hear that. I love it. So thank you, Christian. Uh, everyone that's watching this, go check them out. Capital Real Estate Pros down in Orlando. Uh, work with them. If you're looking at buying properties, go to their, go to their website. Google them up, Capital Real Estate Pros. Find their, their cash buyer site. I actually give people that cash buyer site right here. Uh, what, what's, your, what's your URL for your cash buyer site? I'm trying to pull it up so um, people can buy from you. Buy Cheap Orlando Homes. There we go. Buy CheapOrlandoHomes.com. Go over there and get in on his buyer list if you're looking to buy properties in Orlando. And Christian, thank you for telling your story, man. Pumped to see what uh, 2019 shapes up to be for you. And either way, you're inspiring uh, people along the way because I was following you along the way, man. So thank you. And everyone, go over to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to this and give a rating and review uh, for the Carrot Cast. If this has impacted you in any way, shape, or form, we'd love the rating and review. It helps it get in front of more people so we can spread amazing messages and stories just like Christians. Thank you, guys. Have an awesome rest of the week. Thank you, man. Thank you.